Welcome to the Hand in Hand with God YouTube channel, where the sermons are filled with the Word of God, so you can apply God's truth to your life as you glean them from the teachings that are brought to you by myself, Pastor Daryl Clausen, but more importantly, they're brought to you by the Holy Spirit. Apply God's truth to your life so that He can mold you and shape you into who He wants you to be so that you can shine bright for Him through your words and actions. God bless you as you watch the video. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Hand in Hand with God. We're glad you chose to come out this afternoon to a time where we gather together in a corporate setting. We sing some praises to God. And then we delve into the Word of God with open hearts, allowing God's Word to mold us and shape us into who He wants us to be. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your hand upon our lives. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness to us, Father, how you kept us safe, Father. Thank you, God, for bringing us once again to a corporate setting where we can learn more about you, Father. Lord, we dedicate this time to you open up our spiritual ears and our heart to hear from you, Father. I trust that each of us has come with an open heart to receive your truth from you, Father. I pray, Lord, that with the Holy Spirit you'd help them to apply it to their lives, Lord God. And as I deliver your word, I pray, Lord, that I do so in a clear, concise manner, Father. Thank you, Father God, for never leaving us nor forsaking us, God. We praise and worship your holy name, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I once again welcome you to hand in hand with God. I'm glad each and every one of you chose to come out this afternoon. It's good to see each of your faces. My name is Daryl Clawson, and I'll be sharing the Word of God with you today. Today's sermon is entitled, It's Wise to Kneel. Today we are going to look at our God and what he is like. This week's key passage is Nahum 1, verses 2 to 7, which says, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, and great in power, and will not at all, nor quit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry. He dryeth up all the rivers, fashion languisheth, and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burnt at his presence. Yea, to the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. In verse 7, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. It is wise to kneel before the God of the universe. Yes, I am talking about the God of the Christians, who is the one who came to earth as Jesus, the Son of God, to die for all of our sins, and God raised him from the dead to give us hope for eternal life. Let's start with looking at verse 2. It is true that the Almighty God whom we serve as Christians is jealous, revengeful, and angry. But let's look at these character traits in context. He takes out his revenge on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. This doesn't seem like the description of a God whom you'd also describe as having unconditional love, mercy, and grace. It seems more like this is the God whom you would think twice about crossing. As a matter of fact, if anyone was entering into a relationship 
with someone with a description of being jealous and angry, the relatives would strongly advise against it. However, with God, this is not the case. When we take into account all of God's character traits, He is the one whom you want to have by your side, and He is the one who you should choose to be the God of your life. Jealous. In the context of a human-to-human -human relationship, if one person in the relationship is a jealous individual, it will cause problems in the relationship because he or she will not be able to trust the other person. The good news is that Almighty God is not like this. It is true that He is jealous and wants us to choose Him as our only God, but that is not because His jealousy is misplaced. It is because He is the Almighty God who deserves to be the God in your life. Revelation 4, verse 8 and 11 tell us why God's jealousy is warranted. Revelation 4, verse 8 says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is holy to come. And verse 11, the angels are also saying this to God in heaven. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God is a jealous God because he knows who he is. He knows that he is holy and eternal. God also knows that he is the creator of everything, and that everything in the present and past that he created is proof that he is worthy to receive all glory, honor, and power. Quite frankly, God knows that there is no one else like him. Therefore, he is the only God with whom you will not go wrong, choosing him to be your God. Jesus emphasizes that we as human beings are to surrender to who God is and choose him to be our only God in Mark 12, verses 29 and 30. Mark 12, verse 29. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. God wants everyone to love Him. And when we choose to turn to Him to have our sins forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ, then God expects us to keep Him as the only God in our life and love Him with our whole heart, soul, and mind. Vengeance. There is one thing that God cannot stand, and that is sin. We demonstrate that we are an enemy of God when we sin and sin cannot go unpunished. James 4 verses 1 to 4 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? War. Ye lust, and have not. Ye kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. And verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We are not a friend of God when we have sinned in our lives. When we are not a friend of God, then we are an enemy of God. And it is towards His enemies that He has anger simply because they have not repented of their sins. When we have sin in our life, whether you are a Christian or not, then you are an enemy towards God.
the good news is that God made it possible for you not to be his enemy. Therefore, it is possible for you not to be the recipient of God's vengeance towards unrepentant sin. Let's look at Romans 5 verses 8 and 9. Then we'll look at John 3 verse 36. And then Romans 1 verse 18. Romans 5 verses 8 and 9. But God commanded his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. It is because we believe that Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, died for our sins, that we are justified and saved from God's wrath. John 3 verse 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The choice is yours. You can either choose to believe on Jesus Christ and receive eternal life, or you can choose not to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for your sins, not receive eternal life, but the wrath of God for your unforgiven sins. Romans 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. People know that there is a God. They are just too prideful to admit it. They hold the truth in unrighteousness because their unyielded heart to God leaves their unforgiven sins in their life, all the while knowing that God is God and can forgive them and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. People know that God is angry with their sin, but they don't turn to God and repent of their sins. Yes, our Heavenly Father is vengeful and angry, but He is only that way towards sin. Therefore, if you do not want to be a recipient of God's vengeance and anger, then turn to Him and ask Him to forgive you of your sins in the name of Jesus. Nahum 1 verse 3 states character traits of God that we would rather acknowledge Him having than being vengeful or jealous. In Nahum 1 verse 3, we see that the God of the universe is slow to become angry, extremely powerful, does not let the wicked off the hook for their sins, and He controls the whirlwind and storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Regarding God being slow to become angry, let's look at Genesis 15, verse 16, which says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God was talking to Abraham about the land of Canaan that he had promised to give to his descendants. God told Abraham about his descendants spending 400 years in Egypt and then coming and taking the land from the Amorites. Nahum 1 verse 2 tells us that God would take out his vengeance for sin on people, which we see here in Genesis 15 verse 16. But we also see God's character trait of being slow to become angry, which is stated in Nahum 1 verse 3. Yes, it is true that God gave the Amorites 400 years to repent of their sins. But do not think for one moment that you can continue to procrastinate repenting for the sins in your life. One thing that is for certain is that you will not have 400 years worth of opportunities to repent of your sins. The second thing that is certain regarding your life that you do not know when you will take your last breath. And the longer that a person delays surrendering their life to God, the harder it gets for them to do it. Therefore, do not procrastinate nor take advantage of God's patience and slowness to become angry. In other words, so that you will have eternal life, 
Don't waste your life not asking God to forgive you of your sins. Proverbs 11 verse 21 says, Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Whether an individual is practicing sin by his or herself, or with a group of friends, God will not let their sin go unpunished. On the other hand, the lineage of the righteous will be delivered from God's punishment towards sin. From the latter part of the third verse to verse 5 in Nahum 1, it talks about what God controls and the results of who he is and how creation responds to him. The whirlwind and the storm both do what God tells them. God is so vast and powerful that the dust of his feet are the clouds. In other words, God walks on the clouds. God rebukes the sea and can dry it up. God also has the power and authority to dry up all the rivers. And because he can dry up the rivers, areas of the land experience hardship. Creation respects and fears God so much that mountains shake, hills melt, and the earth is burned when he is around. It is not just the world that experiences God's awesomeness, but everything that lives in the world does as well. We can learn a lot from creation, because if it fears God, then who are we as people to not fear God? Here in Canada, we live in a democracy. Therefore, we understand the importance of the majority ruling. Even though the majority isn't always right, in this case, they are. In the above passage, we have every aspect of God's creation, knowing that they are under His power and authority and surrender to Him. If you are not yet a Christian, pay attention to how creation respects God and are not the same after they interact with Him and compare that to your life. I strongly encourage you, non-Christian, to surrender your life to God and let Him do the work in your life that He wants to. For those of you who are already Christians, we too can learn from these few verses. I know when I look at my life and compare it to this passage of Scripture, I definitely need to pull up my socks and give God the fear and respect that He deserves. It is wise to kneel. Yes, it is. Taking what we have learned thus far through Nahum 1, verses 2 to 5, about who God is. This is where the title of the sermon comes into play. When God is calling you to repent of your sins, you only have one of two responses. The first and most wise is to kneel and repent of your sins before Him. The second is the most foolish response, which is to turn and walk away. We know that we cannot stand before God when He is angry because of our sin. We cannot live in nor survive the anger that God has towards sin if He were to release His anger towards our sin upon us. Even though it may not look like God has poured out His anger upon you for the sins in your life, this does not mean that God is not angry at you for the sins which you have committed. Remember, God is slow to become angry. God is giving you opportunities to repent of your sins before you get punished for them. If you are procrastinating, repenting of your sins, there are only two things that can happen. The first is that God will pour out His anger upon you, which will feel like fire engulfing you and rocks hitting you. Or you will die living in your sin and experience eternal torment in hell because of your pride and arrogance and not turning to God in repentance for your sins, asking Him to forgive you of your sins. Keep in mind that during this lifetime on earth, when you are experiencing God's anger upon your life because of the sin that you refuse to repent, 
It is not only God punishing you for your sin, but it is also His attempt to have you repent of your sins. It's beneficial. It's beneficial to choose to kneel before the Lord your God, who is your Creator. It is not only beneficial because your sins will be forgiven and you will not have to worry about God's anger coming upon you for your sin that you haven't repented of. But it is also beneficial because then throughout your life you will have the Creator of the universe on your side. The only true God is good. God is good because those who trust in Him know that they will be protected in the day of trouble if they turn to Him for protection. When you trust in God, you have a relationship with Him. And as it is with any relationship, the people involved in the relationship know each other and your relationship with God is no different. When you bow your knee to the Almighty God and ask Him to forgive you of your sins, you start a relationship with Him and you begin to trust Him. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. Anyone who has a relationship with God through Jesus Christ knows that without a shadow of a doubt, God is good. This is because we have a relationship with God. And when you have a relationship with someone, you experience their friendship throughout the ups and downs of life. As you go through life with God by your side and you have trusted Him during both the good times and the bad times in your life, and because you have trusted God, you've experienced the blessings which come into your life because you put your trust in Him. The blessings that we experience as Christians because of our trust in God affect every aspect of our lives and are experienced as all sorts of blessings, whether it be relational, provisional, spiritual, or emotional, just to list a few. Psalm 9, verses 9 and 10 says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. There are a plethora of reasons why God is good. But one of them is that we can run to him in our time of trouble. One thing for certain about life is that throughout our life we will have many opportunities to run to God for shelter and protection because of life's trials and tribulations. Jesus said that he would never leave us nor forsake us, which means that when we need him, he will always be there for us. Due to God's consistency in always being there for us, we know that we can always trust him which means that we will always be able to experience His goodness regardless of what is going on in our life. In conclusion, the God of the universe, the one who created you and died for your sins so that you could have a healthy relationship with Him, is the God who hates sin. Due to the degree to which God detests sin, He is angry towards people who sin and will take out his anger towards unrepentant sin on people who have not asked him to forgive them of their sins. The only way to avoid God's anger when it is time for him to discipline people for their sins is to ensure that your sins are forgiven. The only way to ensure that your sins are forgiven is to kneel before the Lord God who created you and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Once you have a relationship with God, you will notice that He is a good God and that you can go to Him throughout your life for shelter and protection when your life gets tough. However, you will have a much stronger relationship with God and trust Him more if you go to Him for shelter and protection when things are going well in your life and stay with Him through the tough times as well. There is no reason for we as individual human beings created in the image of God not to choose to trust in Him other than our pride. When we look at all of 
creation, we see that they are affected by the presence of Almighty God. And the same is true for us humans if we choose to surrender our life to Him. Take a lesson from creation and choose to surrender your life to God if you haven't done that yet. And if you have, if you're already a Christian, ask God if there are any areas in your life that you have yet to surrender to Him and ask Him to show you any sin that you haven't repented of yet. God is a good God and the only way to experience that He is a good God is to first of all have a relationship with Him through faith in Jesus Christ. Second, to continually strengthen your existing relationship with Him by trusting Him for shelter and protection regardless of what is going on in your life. It's time to pray. If God has placed something on your heart, then you can take that up with Him directly. As for the rest of you, I invite you to pray a corporate prayer with me if you so choose. In this prayer, there's an opportunity to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior if you haven't done that yet. And then we'll talk to God about us having fear and respect for Him that He deserves. For the corporate prayer of the words will be on the screen. Lord God, You are the only wise God. You are in a class all by Yourself. There is none like You because You are the only holy, true, eternal, and almighty God. And I worship You for those reasons amongst others. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against You. And repenting of my sins, I ask God that You forgive me of all my sins because I believe that Jesus Christ is Your Son who died for my sins and whom You raised from the dead. Father God, I thank You that I am now baptized into Christ, baptized with the Holy Spirit, thus sealed by the Holy Spirit into Your kingdom. I ask God that You would also fill me with the Holy Spirit. Father God, I surrender my life to You, making Jesus the Lord of my life. Lord God Almighty, You detest sin. Therefore, I repent for doing I ask God that you would forgive me for doing it. God, you are supreme and justified in your judgment towards sin. I thank you, Father God, for providing an avenue through Jesus Christ for my sins to be forgiven. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me, Lord God. Heavenly Father, I praise and worship you for being the good God that you are. Thank you, Father God, for the times that you have protected me when I came to you for shelter and protection because my life was tough. Lord God, I also praise you for the relationship that we have developed over the years. Thank you, Lord God, for being faithful to me and for knowing me because I put my trust in you. My Heavenly Father, I look forward to our relationship strengthening because I choose to repent of my sin when I am convicted of it and to be close to you during both the good and bad times in my life so that I can develop a deeper trust in you. I pray this to you, Father God, because you are the eternal God who reigns supreme and created all things for your pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you have called each of us to have a healthy relationship with you, Father God, and that we can do that through faith in Christ Jesus. Father God, help each of us to understand how much you detest sin, Father, and help us to live a life that is pleasing to you, Lord God. I ask that you give us the strength and the wisdom to withstand Satan's temptation so that we can live a life that's pleasing to you, Father God. Thank you, God, for the guidance and direction that you've given to us, Father, 
thank you for our relationship with you strengthening every day as we spend more time with you and prioritize in our life our relationship with you, Father God. Lord, as we go our separate ways this week, I pray that you keep each of us safe and bring us back safely next week, Father God, so that we can learn more about you in a corporate setting and apply the truths contained within your word to our lives, Father God. Father God, I pray that your blessing would go before each of us, Father, that your favor would go before us as well and be evident in our lives, God. Thank you, Lord, for your hand of protection and safety upon our lives. We thank you for that, Father. Praise your holy name, God. In Jesus' name, amen. The passage of scripture I'd like to leave with you is Hebrews 10, verses 16 to 17. This is a covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their heart, and in their minds I will write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. We are in this era right now. Through Christ Jesus we have a covenant with God, in which when we repent of our sins, believing that the blood of Jesus makes it possible for our sins, to be forgiven, and God forgives us of our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. As Christians, we have the Holy Spirit living within us, who reminds us of the godly things that we have been taught. Therefore, God's laws are written on our minds and put in our hearts. With the Holy Spirit living within us and convicting us of our sins and iniquities, and us responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, repenting of our sins and iniquities, we know that we will be saved from God's vengeance towards sin when He judges people for their unrepented sin, including hell, because we have God to protect us, and we will be spending eternity in heaven with God, our Heavenly Father. Know without a shadow of a doubt that through the blood of Jesus Christ, your sins and iniquities that you repent of are forgiven by Almighty God, and He does not remember them anymore. God bless you. Go with God and no one else. Thanks for watching.